else do I think there was? Yeah. Sorry about so that. So that's, uh, put things short, that's how I got here. Um, yeah, spent a fair bit of time in the rail industry even before I uh, got to where I am now. Uh, started the graduate scheme uh, with CFW uh, just as COVID kicked in. Uh, we stopped carrying passengers. We started working at home. Um, and all the consultancies who normally would have provided these design placements um, were also working from home, so weren't, weren't able to accommodate uh, the traditional race design placement. Um, so that's, that's my background and how I got involved with this project. And uh, let's move on to the loco. And I'll, I'll go over this again, uh, back to normal pace. So it was built 1945 by Vulcan Foundry um, to a war department design. Um, it's a very similar for, for those of you with a keen eye um, to the London Midland Scottish ETF, um, but a slightly lighter weight design and uh, a few tweaks to make it simpler to build so that any of the manufacturers of the country at the time um, could have built one for the same design. Uh, after, it's, after it was built in 1945, um, it went off to the Netherlands and was used there to support the war efforts, moving troops and supplies around Europe. Um, a few years down the line then, it was sold to Sweden, where it was heavily modified, as you can see in the picture there, um, up in the Arctic Circle. Um, so the big headlights, the extra chimney, um, and a fully enclosed cab for, for working in snow. So um, it sat there then. It didn't run many miles in Sweden, um, but it sat there for a number of years in a strategic reserve uh, in case Sweden had issues with their oil supply in the future and had to revert to coal for everything, um, which proved not to be the case. And in the 1970s, then it was brought back to the Peking Wood Valley um, and restored, restored to its original. Um, Design spec, I suppose. Um, so the, the issue that the Worth Valley had asked me to address um, actually came to light in 2017. Um, so this is the horn guide here. I will uh, talk about the parts of the local in more detail as you get into it. Um, but the, the horn guide sits against the actual box um, and they've measured a slightly too great a clearance here, um, which is actually a result of the, uh, the piston forces on the wheel, um, causing the horn guides to splay out and to bend the frame, to the frame plates of the loco. Um, and then when, once you get clearance is building up, uh, you start to get a hammering action with every stroke of the piston and uh, the damage just gets worse and worse from there until things start cracking. So it looked uh, on an exaggerated scale, looked a bit like that with uh, the left hand plate bending and the uh, clearance there around the horn guides alongside the axle, if they don't want. Uh, so the Worth Valley had uh, drawn up an improvement, which involved um, welding in some, some beams, basically some frame stretches between the two plates uh, on each side of the horn guides, uh, just to constrain everything and, and add a bit of stiffness wherever there was space. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, 90733 was was built to quite a lightweight design. Uh, it was for a similar head and freight loco uh, with a bit more budget and uh, a bit more thought in the design. Uh, we've actually got a, uh, a one piece, much, much more substantial form block, which is doing the same job around the axle there. And you've got plenty of stretches uh, between the frames to, to give you a nice stiff frame. So uh, one of the tasks I had really was to, to sell this back to the company and uh, explain why I was working on what you could be seeing as a historic problem. Um, and the photo there for reference is, uh, is 90733 once it was restored to its original state uh, back on the Worth Valley. Um, so at the time, around the 1930s or 40s, um, it was kind of accepted that frame cracks would occur. Um, for some of the worst locos at the time, that was happening after five to eight years in service, you would get to overhaul, um, they cut out the damaged metal, welding you can see, and carry on to wax overhaul. Yeah. But we, we like to think uh, nowadays that we, we hold our engineering and based on the last 80 years of knowledge, based on the last 80 years of how knowledge has moved on, um, we would be expecting to hold ourselves to a slightly higher standard, possibly. Uh, looking at this, uh, 
looking at the smartphone from my point of view, obviously I've got access to 80 years of new knowledge and new tools available um, before it around in the 1940s. Um, so this is an example of one of the papers um, presented by Mr. Clark to the IMP in 1939, which I've used quite heavily, um, but also built on slightly. Uh, so this, this is typical of one of the resources from time which I've had access to. Uh, is throughout my studies and, uh, and even since in the day job, we've been using sources that look a little bit more like this one, uh, which was actually published even a few years since I left. The year. So uh, very up to date and uh, a very different format to, uh, to get your understanding from. Uh, the tools have changed equally as much, if not more. So uh, yeah, one of the papers at the time makes use of these mechanical strain gauges. Uh, where they'd then be taking all these measurements, um, generally just on a test rig or something like that, not, uh, not instrumenting the training service or anything like that. Uh, they'd then have a load of readings written down, which they'd send off to a room full of people to do the calculations and get a result back, which, uh, which is very, very labor intensive, takes a long time, very expensive. Um, I've been used quite heavily of Spider, which is a Python package. So it looks a bit more like what you see there. That's, that's not my code. Uh, that's the marks and stuff. Um, but using Spider and using computer programming, um, you're able to run through your calculations a lot faster. You're able to adapt them to cover different locos or, um, or to then take those figures and plug them directly into something downstream in the design process. Um, and so then, if anyone is interested, you have to share the scripts that are written for this project. If anyone's got an interest in uh, developing anything further from them. Yeah. It's important to note as well that uh, whilst we could have approached an agency that specialises in CAD and uh, finite element analysis and got a nice big report, so it's really detailed, um, that's not really my remit in this project. I was focusing very much on using the knowledge and the tools that were available to me at the time. So given how much engineering has moved on in the last uh, 80 to 90 years, um, it's easy. It could be easy to think that uh, trains and, and structures on trains in general, bending and cracking, is no longer going to be an issue. But as we found out last year, uh, that's not quite the case. Uh, yeah, a few uh, chuckles in the room there. But uh, yeah, really, really significant disruption up and down the country when this uh, stress corrosion cracking became apparent uh, after trains that have been in service for three and a half to four years at the time. Um, so there's been plenty of reports and plenty of reviews on it since, uh, and what it's really highlighted is that there is still a need, um, even as a fleet engineer, to be, uh, to be making use of, of the knowledge and the techniques that you've got available to you to make a decision. Sometimes affecting safety, sometimes performance, sometimes uh, availability, but to be able to make a decision uh, using what you've got available in a reasonably short time frame. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's how I've got here. Um, that's what I've been asked to do and why I'm doing it. Uh, so a bit of background now, uh, getting into the technicalities of the steam locomotive a little bit more. I'm aware that for some of you, uh, this might be very back to basics, um, but I know we have got quite a broad audience, so I'm going to give them just enough detail to uh, know what we're talking about before we uh, go through the calculations. This is a very basic PowerPoint graphic of a steam loco. Um, the frame in most of the UK examples is consisting of two parallel plates. Um, these blank spaces here are what's called the bone gaps, and those are where the axles sit. Um, and you've got your cylinders there positioned up front in this example. Uh, so the frame is doing multiple different things. It's not, not just a lump of metal. Uh, it's got to support the weight of the boiler, the foot plates, the firebox, and everything else on the locum. It's got to support that weight and transfer it to the suspension, uh, which in this case is uh, consisting of leaf springs. It's got to transmit traction forces from the piston through the axles driving the train forward um, into the drag box, which is a sector at the back, um, and pull the rest of the train, basically. It's also got to contribute to doing uh, part of that work and braking too. And there's a trade-off, really, um, between being completely stiff and resisting all the forces you throw at it uh, versus being 
flexible enough to negotiate some of the more tightly curved track you know, without wearing out your wheels and you, you know, really controls too much. Um, all of it, of course, it's got to be within gauge and uh, reasonably achievable to manufacture at the same time. So there's a lot of different competing demands all around control. Let's have a look then at uh, 90733. Um, so this is actually a, a scale drawing that we put together as part of the project. Uh, so the blue details you can see there, um, firstly, are the existing structure of the loco. So everything in there that's blue, you can imagine it's, it's going across between the two frame plates. And we're looking at it from the right hand side here. The details in red are the existing horn guides, which you can see in the photo there. Um, so they're what constrain the axle box, um, allow it to move vertically, but they're transferring attractive forces from the axle and the lateral curving forces side to side. Um, and that's rooted on around the horn gap, as you can see in the photo. Um, and the final detail on there then is the green, the few green pieces you can see, they're called the horn stays. Um, so you can just see it's bolted in there. Obviously the horn stay is keeping the axle box in place, um, but it's also quite significant in terms of how the frame carries on the loads that are on it. So the, the fit of the horn stays um, has historically been quite an important issue to address. You really uh, reaming your holes type thing and uh, sometimes using tape with wedges and things like that to, to get a good fit and, and not get any slack building up in there. Mm -hmm. but mentioned that uh, it's all got to fit within a gauge. So there's some compromises to be made. Uh, the first of these is the fact that the cylinders are on the outside of the loco, which you can see in the bottom right there on this plan view. The outside cylinders, they allow you to have a, a wider piston diameter, uh, get more force on the piston and more tractive effort. Uh, we've got a narrow firebox, so that, uh, that sits towards the rear of the loco and it actually drops down in between the two frame plates. Um, which is great, but it, it uh, does compromise your ability to reinforce your frame to get towards that section of it. Um, and the axle boxes, so they're you've seen in the, the photo there, that's the axle box. Um, your bearings, it's, it's not like a modern sort of roller bearing that we're used to. Um, it is literally a, a portion shaped piece of metal with a, a white metal surface on there. It uh, rides on the oil film around the axle journals. Um, you can see those highlighted on the diagram there in that uh, light pink colour. Um, and those are inboard of the frame. Um, so the American examples as a comparison use a, a bar frame where you can keep everything in line much better. Um, but the root of the issue really on 90733 is the fact that these are set inboard of the frame plates and therefore they create a moment which is bending the plates. So that's how it's made. Um, quick stop on... Uh, on how it actually moves then. So we're again looking from the right hand side, um, in the 280 configuration, uh, 90733 has four driven axles. So I've uh, just sketched two of them there. The piston is at the front. Uh, the really clever bit is this valve shirt spell here. Uh, there's plenty of videos online to show you how that works and, and animate it nice and slowly. Um, the key thing to remember about it is that you can be emitting steam either from the front of the cylinder or the rear of the cylinder and venting from the opposite side. Uh, so what the driver's controlling, you know, two things really, the driver's got the regulator and it's controlling the, the pressure that's submitted to the cylinder. And with the reverse, so then the driver's controlling what's called the cutoff, which is the length of time in each stroke for which steam is admitted. So you can have a, uh, you can have a, a lit cutoff when you're trying to move away at uh, low speed and high move. Putting steam into the piston for uh, a large proportion of the stroke. Once you get up to a uh, higher speed, you don't need as much torque. You go to a, uh, a shorter cutoff, uh, it helps to run a bit more economically, and you don't need that much torque. Uh, the connecting rod is actually driving the third axle of four in this case, and uh, the four, four driving wheels are connected on each side by the side rod. Final point. To note on this one um, is what's called the quartering. So we've got the right hand piston you can see here. The right hand piston is actually leading the left hand one by 90 degrees. So what that means is um, you've always got torque to be able to move the train away. 
Um, if you come to a stop, if one piston's at dead center, not producing any torque, um, the other piston will be at 90 degrees to the maximum torque. So we've seen how it's made. Uh, we've got three new turns there, potentially, which are the, the horn gaps. So the, the bit of the frame of the axle fits through. The horn guides, which hold the axle box in that space. And the horn stays, which are bolted along the bottom. Uh, and just be aware that, uh, yeah, we've got forward and backward stroke with the piston as well to take account of. We go on to what I actually did as part of this project then. Um, so these are the four main stages. Uh, I gave my report it's quite a nice logical structure. Um, it's worth noting though that uh, in reality, it's, uh, it's a bit more iterative, a bit more cycling through than until the, all the results that you, you're getting are in alignment. We start with working out the axle box reaction forces and how they're bending the frame. And it's a bit more mathematical from this point onwards. Uh, so the most intuitive place to start is the middle of the forward stroke. So uh, the crack there is at uh, 270 degrees from your front dead center position. Uh, the key dimensions to start with, the D in all of these calculations is the diameter of the driving wheel, 56 inches in this case. Uh, X is the piston stroke, which is also equal to the diameter of the circle, uh, which is followed by the crank pin around the inside of the wheel. Um, so in this case, it's 28 inches. Let's look at the forces then. Um, we've got the piston force P, in this case, is pushing forward. So that's going to be the product of the pressure in the cylinder over the uh, cylinder's area. That's going to be pulling the crank pin forward, pulling the top of the wheel forward and rolling the wheel. Um, see, so the wheel pushes against the rail, and the rail pushes equally against the rail pushes equally backwards against the wheel, uh, pushes the wheel forward. So that's T, contractive effort force. That, that's what's driving the train. Uh, and then looking at the axle, obviously the weight of the train is pushing backwards. Um, and you're also trying to stretch your frame slightly. So where, where that tractive effort is reacted, the force pushing backwards on the axle is going to be called T2 in this case. Let's look at the opposite point in the stroke then. Um, this is the backward stroke. This is where it gets a, a little bit more tricky. So now we're emitting steam into the front of the cylinder. We're pushing the bottom half of the wheel backwards. Tractive effort, of course, because the wheel's rolling forwards, and the tractive effort is still pushing the train forwards. Uh, but at this point, your axle, your, your axle, your, your frame is actually pushing the axle forwards. We've got the same thing at different points there, um, but slightly opposite directions of the forces. So in each of these positions, uh, what we can do is we can work out the tractive effort quite simply. Tractive effort uh, is going to be your piston force times the ratio between your piston stroke and your driving wheel diameter. As I mentioned, you've got a 56 inch wheel and a 28 inch piston, which gives you a half. So, your tractive effort uh, at those 90 degree points is going to be half your piston force. Uh, so that's quite nice and easy to visualize. If we took that wheel and put it on the front of a penny farthing boat, um, so that shows the, the physics of what's going on there. Uh, we did crank the amount to that bit in red is your, your distance S. Um, in this case, we've got a big wheel, so it uh, gives you more speed, but the loss of mechanical advantage. If we have a smaller wheel or a, long, a longer crank, you're getting more tractive effort, more torque delivered to uh, the wheels, but you're going to have a slightly lower top speed. Yeah. It's not quite that simple in the case of a steam loco, where you've got a frame that's actually connecting your axles to the piston. Uh, if you had something like an electrical multiple unit with a, a traction motor just driving the one axle, then uh, that back to different calculation is absolutely fine. Um, but there's a bit more investigation. So to find these T1 and T2 forces, which are the ones on the, from the axles pushing the frame forward and backwards, 
what we need to do is we need to take real this event the contact point between the wheel and the rail. Um, hold your instantaneous center of rotation. That's like an hour that you can see at the bottom there. Um, and by doing this, you can see that you're getting a different value in the middle of your backward stroke versus the forward stroke. Um, so in the backward stroke, it's actually one minus S over D, one minus a half. And in your forward stroke, it actually turns out as one plus S over D, but one plus a half. And at either dead center position, um, you're not getting any torque, but you're basically trying to stretch your compression frame directly. Um, so that third value, T3 there, is just going to be equal to P. It took a bit of head scratching, um, uh, a lot of pages of notes to actually marry these up. Um, but that final line there, the attractive effort at any point is going to be equal to the difference between the piston force and the axle box reaction. Um, it's only actually when you get to that point that uh, that you know, both make sense. And that's quite important to see later. Um, so what we can see in the, the question I was asked at the word value is, well, where does this force go? And we can see that uh, we're actually stretching and compressing our frame at this point. So in the backward stroke, we've got uh, P and T1 in opposite directions facing inwards. Um, so you're actually pulling the frame forward by the front of the cylinder. And um, yeah, you're pulling the frame forward by the front of the cylinder and you're stretching the frame. Whereas in the, in the forward stroke, you're pushing the frame forward from the, from the axle, from the bearings and you're compressing your frame. Possibly the other way around, but for that at the end. Uh, like any good engineering problem, you've got to make some assumptions to simplify your analysis. So the first one of these um, is that the force P, we've worked out at 85% of boiler pressure, uh, which is generally quite widely used as a best practice, you know, very rarely running at 100% below the pressure. Uh, we're assuming that the piston is acting horizontally. Uh, in the case of the uh, 1973's design, it's actually angled downwards by about 1.6 degrees. Um, but if you take the cosine of 1.6 degrees, it's 0 0.999, so it's easily precise enough to use calculations still. And we're assuming that um, the force is going to be equally distributed across all four of the driven axles. Um, probably isn't the case in reality, um, but we can put even another massive piece of work to um, to actually verify this. Probably a lot of strain gauges on the loco and service and things like that. Um, the biggest cutoff, the biggest cutoff, the biggest assumption that I've made um, is that we're running at a 100% cutoff. So that force P, um, you're admitting steam all the way through the piston cycle, which is kind of representative at low speed with a high load starting away, um, it's less valid at higher speed when you're running with a shorter cutoff of 20-30%. It makes the graph look a little bit easier. So this was the first of the Python scripts I created. Um, like I said, I'm happy to send it to anyone who is interested. Um, this is a screenshot of it, but uh, just to give you an idea of, of what it's doing there. Uh, the first section is defining all of the constants. Um, so in this case, those are all really the, the dimensions of the loco, your wheel sizes, your piston diameters, and your pressure. Then we're just implementing all the maths that we've just seen. Um, so calculating each of those T1, T2, and T3 forces. And the final step there is to check uh, where I mentioned the difference between the attractive efforts and the piston force. Um, you're doing those subtractions in the forward stroke and the backward stroke. You're checking that they're equal to make sure that you've done the process properly. We've got another layer of complexity to get through, I'm afraid, um, which of course is the fact that the T1 forces that we've calculated so far, they're assuming uh, that all of, your, all of your forces are acting in one plane, which looking at the plan view isn't the case. So the, the right-hand piston that we've got pictured there, um, some of its some of its T force is going to be reacted by the right hand horns, and some of it's going to be reacted by the left hand horns. Um, so we need a further step in the calculation just to 
a portion of this force is basically based on the lateral spacing of all those parts. And then, of course, we've got two pistons um, doing the same thing, but at different points in time. So uh, we've got the quarter ring again, the right piston leading the left one by 90 degrees. So each piston is going to be having an effect on both, both axle boxes, both sets of horns. So um, we've got to superimpose all of those forces there. Um, we've got to superimpose all of those forces to actually get a full picture of what's going on. So taking the values from Python and plotting them in a graph looks a bit like this, which I'll just give you a second to fully absorb and uh, take a breath before I go through it. We can, we can start there with the right-hand piston. Noting that this is a graph of the force on the right-hand horns throughout the cycle. Um, so obviously your backward stroke between 0 and 180 degrees, your right piston is pushing backwards on the horns. Um, after 180 degrees, your rear dead center flips direction, it's pushing the horns forward. Uh, up to a peak in the middle of its stroke, it's uh, 270. Um, the right piston is having a far greater effect on the right hand horns than the left piston, by both of being closer to it, quite intuitive really. Um, and the left piston is having a much smaller effect on the right hand horns, and being 90 degrees out of phase, it's flipping direction at 90 and 270 degrees uh, rather than 180. So, all the E's and F's that we've calculated, we've uh, popped in there. And the result is the plot in orange. Um, so adding those two up at every point throughout the cycle gives you that shape. And then you can see it hits a point there, an uh, absolute peak at 270 degrees. So at that point, the right piston, you can imagine, is in the middle of its forward stroke at 90 degrees and maximum, maximum torque and maximum reaction. Um, and the peak occurs just before the left is the, the swapping direction from pushing forwards to pushing backwards. So that's the overall shape of the graph um, and the maximum value there that uh, we're going to use going forward. When you put them next to each other, the left and the right, uh, you get quite another quirky result, which again takes a bit of time to get your head around. Um, so they're doing the same thing, but they're not doing the same thing uh, in the same direction. Um, so you can see the shape of the right horn forces that we just looked at, um, but the left being 90 degrees out of phase um, and not 180 degrees out of phase isn't doing the exact opposite to it. Um, it's actually hitting the peak slightly later and then, and then dropping down. Um, and those are symmetrical there in terms of the angle at uh, 135 and 315 degrees. Um, so we know that, yeah, the tractive effort on, on the forward and back of strokes is equal, which we've shown, um, but the load on the frame is equal and has a peak at one point in the cycle. Um, the really interesting thing about this graph is that it was actually probably 80 to 100 years of locos being in service um, before I think it was a rough engineer who actually showed this mathematically. Um, until then, there were all sorts of opinions and all sorts of assumptions that had gone unchallenged until this was yeah. Yeah, so the peak value there you can see is uh, just over 600 kilonewtons. Um, that's the total of all four driven axles. So we're dividing that by four and multiplying it by the offset distance between the green plates and the center of the axle box. And that's giving us the moment that's going to be bending the green plates. So let's see what effect that has then. Um, this is going back to what's really much more of a, a classic <laughs> mechanical engineering problem. Uh, plenty of sources online and uh, on various textbooks that I'll show you how to do this calculation yourself. Uh, so we've modeled it as a, a classic simply supported beam. The bits in light gray there are the resisting bits of frame structure. Uh, and we've had to analyze each section of the frame one at a time because they've all got slightly different dimensions. Now, so the existing, existing structures in grey uh, at point A and point B is giving you a reaction 
against this uh, applied well. That's, that's why I think our fiscal force is our home guide. Uh, when you've got a simply supported beam with an applied moment, the shear force on the level is constant wherever that um, wherever that moment is applied. The support reactions are going to be equal in value. So our ring RP are going to be the same. Again, we would like to avoid that moment is applied. And uh, the bending moment, so not, not this moment that's acting here. Uh, the bending moment is a, a fictitious tool to analyze what's going on inside the metal. Uh, the bending moment switches direction at the point where the moment is applied, so in this case, the middle of the horn gap. Here's a modern approach then. Uh, in a classic equation there, but uh, your, your bending moment is related to mu, which is a deflection by its second derivative. Uh, and the parameters that control that are E, which is the, the young modulus, the stiffness of the steel that you're using, uh, and I, which is the second moment of area. So that's how well the force, how well, how well the material within the frame is, is distributed to react that bending. We could integrate this twice and put numbers in at uh, eight different points throughout the frame and find, have to find the constants of integration at every point throughout this process. Obviously, that's risky because you're going to be picking up errors somewhere and carrying them through. Um, it's also a lot of work to carry out, given that uh, most of this process I've reverted to, to pen and paper for. Um, so that's actually used my callings method. Uh, which means there's a step function in that term in brackets there. Uh, and the gist of it is that uh, if that term in brackets is less than zero, we can discount that term from your equation. Um, and if it's greater than zero, we just take it at its value as it is. Again, we've got the second derivative of mu there. So you have to integrate this twice, but uh, it's a lot less work because you've only got to do the integration um, at one point. And you end up with the bottom equation there, which is the shape of the deflection mu, um, and that's going to be valid for every section of the frame. So, uh, yeah, quite a clever method, and uh, it saves you a bit of time. And, um, so if this is all pencil and paper calculation, uh, but the results of it are uh, looking like this. So um, one of the decisions that I made quite early on was that axle one was already stiff enough. Uh, I didn't need any reinforcements adding to it because you've got this as big horizontal plate right above it that you can see all in there. Um, axles two and three uh, have come out nice and symmetrical about each other, whether they're, they're roughly different distance from the existing reinforcements uh, and comparable results for axle four as well. The thing to, uh, to really verify these results. Uh, apart from throwing them into an online beam calculator, for example, uh, is, to, is to just check the magnitude of them. Uh, so 1.5 millimeters, that, that lines up high totally with uh, what some of the drivers of this local had said, is that you can, you can almost see it bending if you look out the, uh, look out the foot plate and it's moving off. Uh, and they're a little number, so it's not it's not bending five meters out to the side or something like that, which would, uh, would obviously show that you're getting lots of this out. Uh, that one point five millimeters is quite believable. Yeah. So we go back now to what the work value was doing to the frame. Yeah, because there's a, a very rough scan of the door in there uh, of what this structure is going to look like. Yeah. The plan was to fit four of these in whichever positions there was space, basically. So those are shown on the bottom drawer in there. Um, Axle 2 was in quite a sparse area in the frame. Uh, it had no space around it. Those axles 3 and 4, we've got the ash pan sits underneath the fire box in that space, um, and the damper door, which needs to be small open as well. So that could stop you from fitting anything in those positions. Uh, so that's quite important. But uh, otherwise, it was just a case of repeating the analysis. Uh, we've just seen this simply supported beam model. Uh, but in this case, with the stretches in place, essentially giving you the same movement being applied to the frame, but over a shorter span. Nice and symmetrical on both sides of the home guides for axle two. Um, and axle three, that span was taken to be from 
new structure back to the existing support. Uh, Axel 4, very similar to Axel, we're not touching, so we're just focusing these two. So let's look at the results that we got from that then. Uh, we got the original ones and the modified result there for Axel 2. Um, you can see it's brought the deflection at the front corner down to about a factor of 10, which is quite reassuring. That's, that's what we were hoping to achieve. Um, it has made it quite like a bigger on the rear corner, uh, but overall, I think it's what it was on front corner before. Uh, we can draw that in a very exaggerated way. Uh, and what's happened is it's brought the overall deflection down, and it's also made it much more symmetrical. So rather than having 1.5 millimeters in the front corner and 0 0.03 millimeter, you've got roughly the same bending now on the front and rear corners. Um, that's quite a nice result. It's quite a, a sign of success and uh, shows that getting these structures is going to be worthwhile. Axle 3, however, um, that's the same for Axle 4, we were only picking one structure. It's not quite as good a picture. So in this case, the front corner deflection hasn't changed at all, um, but it's increased quite substantially for rear corner. Yeah. So that's actually easy enough to validate if you're ever unsure about the uh, about the results you're getting for steel, get yourself a bendy ruler and uh, sit at your desk and manipulate it around whichever way you want to. Um, that's a great way to visualize it without having to be bending steel. What's the screen there? Can we still see? Yeah, perfect. Um, so to do an exaggerated sketch of it again, uh, it's basically made it worse on the unconstrained side. Uh, of course, it. Yeah, it brought one support a lot closer to the one that was applied. Uh, and it's going to spring out on the opposite side if there's nothing there to constrain it. Um, which initially looks quite alarming, but it's intuitive to see. Check it with my bender in the. Um, so the recommendation there that we've got from these results is that you shouldn't go and fit the stretcher across the horns, um, just the one side adapter box. It's probably going to give you some unintended consequences. So that's the conclusion we come to. Two more bits then. Um, so I might pick up the piece slightly because these aren't course for design, but uh, they were further bits of assurance that I did. Um, the first one of these really was to verify that by fitting these stretches, we weren't going to stiffen the frame too much and have it uh, overrun by a flange climb or anything like that. So, um, you know, a real combination of of old and new sources, um, so textbooks from two years ago, combined with you know, Porter's original papers on the on the topic from around a century ago. Uh, the one thing I had to do here was develop it from the two axle model, which is in all the textbooks, you know, which is fine for a bogey. We went up to axles, uh, but develop, developing it for this long, rigid four axle structure uh, actually needs a bit more math labbing in. Uh, in Porter's model, it's important to note is a quite a static model. So this assumes you're going around the at relatively low speed. You haven't got such people forces to worry about. Um, which are two scenarios? I've written a Python script for both of them, uh, which are called free curving and constrained curving in Porter's terms. So in free curving, you've got flange contact on your leading outer axle only. On constrained curving, you've also got flange contact on your trailing inner axle. Uh, the constrained curving, because of the geometry and knowing those two points, it's actually easier to do the maths. Um, but when I did that, you can get a negative figure for that white line towards there. It shows that unless you had, uh, unless you had some weird you know, magnet in the track or something which was attracting the wheel. Uh, you know, they have a force where they're pulling themselves together, it's always going to be pushing. Uh, so, if that comes out as negative, basically, you know, you're in the free curving case, uh, which is a bit slightly more involved one. So, for free curving, as I said, we've got a flange force Y acting on the leading axle only. And what that flange force is doing, um, assuming that you're on such a tight curve that the conical profile of your wheels isn't doing anything, you're just pushing the wheels across the railhead by friction. 
Uh, <coughs> land forces rotating the the whole loco uh, against the friction of the wheels about this uh, this imaginary point for the friction center, which is at some distance x behind the moving axis. Uh, so basically, resolving the forces here. It's all trigonometry. I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but that's what it looks like. Uh, we've got two expressions for y there. And rather than trying to substitute and eliminate all this, which will take ages, uh, by far the nicest way to do it is graphically. I'll come back into Python again. I've got the two expressions for y, uh, and the true value is going to occur at the point where they're equal. Uh, so it's quite nice to see. Uh, and again, some believable results for the friction center being if you have a clue that is behind the leading axle uh, and the land force on the leading axle of. 66 um, so there's plenty more and you could you could almost create an entirely new package of work just based on curving colloquies like this. Uh, but the takeaway from it is that uh, going around the I think this is about a, a 20 chain curve, but I'll double check. Um, going around the 20 chain curve, uh, the look of these dimensions is going to then just bring far more than testing forces do. Uh, so by adding these structures in. Uh, we're not going to be contributing to the uh, curve of the behavior massively. Uh, the final stop then is going to be the fatigue of the worms. Uh, so, moving from the design and what we want to fit and where to uh, how we build it, and uh, is it going to last until the next overhaul, if not the rest of the world going to fly? Uh, this process is quite nicely set out in the standard 7608, which each geometry of the uh, weld is an example there in the top right for one of them, uh, for that butt weld. Uh, each geometry of weld is given a class, and each of those classes gives you the numbers for this SN curve. So, for anyone who's new to fatigue, fatigue failure, uh, this is basically a plot of the stress range, so the difference in tension and compression that the part's going through on the x axis and its expected life on the y. The part made of steel um, at a very low stress range will be below what's called its fatigue limit. Um, we don't have to worry about fatigue occurring after a, a basically a number of cycles. And if the stress range is going above that, then you're following these curves. There's two here that are plotted in the standard N0, um, which is the number of cycles at which you expect <coughs> specimens welded to fail, <coughs> N3, um, which is Three standard deviations below the mean, and that's uh, about, I think, one four percent chance of failure at that number of cycles. So, very safe. Um, there's also a picture <coughs> you've got to apply because we're using thick plates in 20 25 mil. Um, your weld is statistically more likely to contain voids and inclusions and defects like that, um, and it's going to have more residual stresses as the weld cools. Uh, so you actually have to drop the stress that you're allowing down slightly if you're doing a thick weld. Uh, but you can see they plotted that that blue point on the curve is for the part of the design with the lowest fatigue life, and that's still over half a million miles. Uh, it's given that so given that this loop is just being put back together and you know, isn't really Number of miles compared to some of the things we've these days. Uh, that will easily see it through you know, the hundred years, or at least throughout that's near the legend. So just to summarize what we've seen there, um, I've combined the resources to develop a, a rigorous understanding in my head, um, and which I hope is also now going to be a benefit to the wider uh, preservation sector um, of predominantly the frame forces, um, but also a little, touch a little bit on steam loop and cooling behavior. Um, I've taken a critical view on the design and work value proposed and made some recommendations um, to improve the design by doing nothing on access three and four, um, but showing that they will be beneficial on access two. Um, and I've developed my, uh, my confidence in my decision making uh, based on some sound engineering at the same time. And of course, had a really enjoyable two years. It's been my first involvement with anything steam powered. Uh, 
Some final thanks to them, um, particularly to John Reading, Hope and Tom Key, both for their work, Ali, and both of all for the graduate scheme as well. Um, for kind of sitting the scene and supporting all the way through this. Um, and to all of you for being here and guiding in this evening. So uh, I'll hand you back to Tom, who will uh, talk to you some questions, I think. Super. Well, thanks very much uh, for coming to talk to us. That's a nice, nice segue, having that thank you as the final point of your slides, because we're... It, Thanks again for coming to talk to us. It's certainly an area that I'm uh, new to. I don't know a huge amount about, so I've learned a hell of a lot this evening. But enough from me. Uh, I was going to, I was going to start taking questions. So I know I saw one over there, so I'll uh, head over now. Um, yeah. Adding letters, or was it just what was it? Um, yeah, it could be done. Um, what, what we actually suggested as a sort of longer term piece, I think, really, um, was actually redesigning the structure so that if it were sort of a flat H shape and lower down in the frame or something, it could fit around the structure that's there. Um, but yeah, I suppose given that. Uh, um, you could definitely add metal to stiffen it. You just got to be aware of what's around there, in terms of the suspension and things and the brake rigging as well. Um, so it is quite busy around the horn gap already. And of course, on the back side, you haven't got a great deal of things. It's not a great deal to be done there. You know, the only other thing potentially is changing the design of the all blocks like you know, kind of the whole shoe shape going right over the top as one solid piece. And that was that was done quite frequently in the thirties and forties to stop cracking the condition at the time. So there's a few more options there, but fitting stretches asymmetrically is the best way to think. Thanks very much. Uh, I see Mike's got a question, so I'm going to head over to Mike. Hi, Mike Corbett's also retired. Tom, during your research, uh, it's, it's obviously been a fascinating study for you. Uh, did you find any evidence in, in the research over the years, bearing in mind you, you actually went back to the <coughs> proceedings of 1939, but was there any other cases of uh, this kind of, of, of failure occurring during for any other fleet? <coughs> oh. This is even all the designs of locos and, uh, and the operations and mining that they've done in their time. Um, it must have affected someone else at some point. I can't say anyone's ever published anything substantial on it. I think um, maybe the bending was was addressed slightly differently at the time and, and probably just hammered or otherwise formed back into shape um, and just seen as a, a general running issue, I'd imagine, rather than something you want to address with any more engineering. Um, given... Whilst listening to you, it cropped crossed my mind that uh, something like a, a local with a con similar configuration, like an 8F, <laughs> might have experienced something similar. But I appreciate that uh, if the evidence isn't there, written evidence, then we might not know. Um, there's still, still a bit of an open point in my project, in fairness. Um, so we, with Valley, do have an 8F preserved on static display. Yes. which I would absolutely have loved to have a look underneath. Um, it just happens to be that both times I visited the uh, in Worth Valley, uh, they were busy filming the railway children, and uh, that was all off limits. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to imagine that uh, the ATF had a slightly more substantial design, but that's, that's speculation. In a more recent example, maybe may off the Great Central, I don't know if there's anybody... <laughs> Great central on tonight. Might be interested in this. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, right, I'm going to head back. I feel like Walter Grant on a grid walk. Um, a couple right. of questions on the screen. Yeah, yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So, we've got, so thanks for the interesting talk. Question from me: uh, Did the two ten zero version of the Loco suffer the same issue? And that's from Matthew Brooks. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, I'm not entirely sure. The, um, the Keith and Worth Valley, obviously, they've, they've got an 8F static and they've got the 280. Um, 
There's another one in service on the Seven Valley, which I don't think is the 210. Um, I don't know if, if Matt can reply to me quickly as to whether there are any two 210 two in service at all still. So, if, yeah, if there's not, then given that uh, you know, these movements were made in huge numbers and this is the only one surviving. So, um, if, if they were a problem, I think they're, they're probably consigned to history. Oh, I'm about saying doesn't think they're already in service. No, I think this is the last of the authorities still around, isn't it? Well, for me, then, we'll see if there are any other questions that come up. So you mentioned that there was further work potentially that wanted doing. There was a couple of areas you mentioned at the end yeah. that could be uh, that could be investigated further. Now I appreciate you're probably very busy with your with your day job. So is there any chance you would potentially look to involve one of the engineers, say Cardiff or Swansea, um, say a PhD student, and uh, get them involved? Uh, uh, so is there scope for that to be picked up by someone else? I guess is my question. Oh yeah, plenty of it. Um, I think it this project has shown that uh, sort of pairing regs projects with the heritage world has, has been quite a success, I think. Um, so definitely scope to, to do more as, as people's graduate uh, projects as well. But um, I'm, yeah, I'm sure that, uh, that Heritage Railways of the country are, are going to be keen to involve uh, not necessarily PhDs, but definitely sort of student individual or team projects in, uh, in the bachelor's or master's years. If get really looking for something like this with, with a lot of really advanced CAD and simulation and things like that, which would be really beneficial too. So I suppose it could be a way of uh, resolving problems that, that everyone's suffering from in actually quite a cost efficient way, just sharing the learning between the very, various heritage railways. Yeah, massively. And um, yeah, some of the uh, some of the bigger rolling stock manufacturers and, and Tox and Fairness aren't quite good at doing this. Um, it's just it's just making use of that information and being able to keep the keep the flow going really between different years and uh, and actually developing it. Uh, it's quite quite common that someone writes you a nice report with some really useful stuff and then they leave university and uh, and no one ever looks at it again. <laughs> but um, yeah, we do need to get better at, at collecting that information and sharing it. And, uh, I guess almost publishing and journaling it better. So that it's there for everyone to make use of. Yep, definitely. definitely. Um, in terms of questions on life, that's pretty much all I've got. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep an eye on that. I'm going to do the most of thanks at the same time. So if anyone does have any, any last minute questions that they want to come up with. Oh, Mike does. Yep. So I'll head back over to Mike. <laughs> Well, it's just comment, really, without stealing Tom's <coughs> vote of thanks uh, too much, I hope. Um, I just want to stress for people online, uh, this has been a, a, a unique occasion tonight um, because I don't think anybody has ever had <coughs> a presentation quite like this, <coughs> where we've had uh, a, a recent <coughs> uh, individual who's completed the, the railway graduate scheme to get involved in such a design <coughs> Uh, process such as this. I know it came about by accident, uh, uh, probably strictly speaking down to COVID, because I know that uh, Tom <coughs> had to observe, as indeed the railway, Keith Worth Valley had to observe all COVID restrictions at the time. <coughs> and uh, Much of this, I think, was done in probably in Tom's bedroom <coughs> on, his, on his computer. <coughs> but it is, is unique to have <coughs> Uh, this kind of situation where such a young engineer <coughs> has tackled what is a very real and historic problem <coughs> in today's environment using, uh, not I was going to say modern theory, but a lot of it isn't, and nonetheless adapted to, to software and, and using it. So uh, all, all credit to you. I think it's been a fantastic show tonight. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mike. And there's not a huge amount for me to add. Um, so I, I would like to say thanks again. Uh, as, as, I, as I said uh, just a couple of minutes ago, um, I was interested to see when the ruler would come out. Uh, when Tom was uh, setting up, he showed me his <laughs> ruler. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was curious to see when it, when it would make an appearance. And as you say, really, really good way of demonstrating 
how steel works in real life. It's it's a great visual aid. I get to use my uh, my miniature wheel set over. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to come back next time and, uh, and uh, get that involved oh, as well. Uh, yeah, uh, pretty we can see that's my that's my little aluminium wheel set from the uh, machining course, which I was going to talk about, but uh, I guess I'll save that for the the curving behaviour work package in a few years' time. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. And what I'd also say is I, I personally really appreciate the return to basics. As I mentioned, I'm on my steam knowledge is minimal verging on nothing. So for me, it was certainly very health, helpful having, having that. Uh, and it's also, I, I guess what I found really interesting was just how analytically you the problem down as you would like a, as a proper engineer would and came out with a, with a with a fantastic um, solution. I thought it was um, a fascinating piece of work. Um, and also just anecdotes that you mentioned, such as the locomotive bending when taking off. I never thought that was a thing. I didn't realize that was a thing in real life. So um, hugely, huge, huge amount of learning for me, definitely, is how I'd conclude. Um, what I would say to everyone online is that We've got a couple of events coming up in January and February, which uh, I thought I'd mention before we leave you. Uh, the first event we've got is History of Rail Incidents, and that's run by Greg Morse. That's going to be on the 12th of January at half five. Uh, and then we've got our Future of Rail heat in the, at the 23rd of February. That's again half five. Very welcome to join us online. Very welcome to join us in the room. Uh, and if you know of any young engineers that could be interested in taking part, please put them in contact with me. We'd love to hear from them. I think the future of rail is always a great showcase of uh, what young engineers are doing and the value they're bringing to the industry. And we were talking just earlier, weren't we, that you were saying that you, you were involved a couple of years ago as well uh, in the future of rail events. Yes, literally just before the first lockdown. Yeah. So um, as you can see, it's it's something that bears fruit and is a really, really valuable piece of uh, piece of work done by, by the IBP. So I definitely recommend getting your young engineers involved. Um, that's pretty much it from me then. All that's left for me to do is thank you all for taking part uh, and coming along. Have a fantastic Christmas and we'll see you in 2023. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tom. See you.